This has been a great discussion so far, and I think what's been nice is we've really been outlining some of the agents that we use in the frontline therapy, adriamycin, adriamycin and ifosfamide, gemcitabine, and docetaxel. And, and now the question comes, what do you do in the second line? setting. And I don't want to just hear what I didn't do in the first line setting. How do you actually think about patients? And do you actually line things up from the beginning, saying I may use this first and have that as a second line thought option? Damon, what do you do? Yeah, so as Marty excellently pointed out and gave us a construct for um, the, a cancer journey and palliation rather than cure, um, what I tend to do is to, to uh, consider the histology, include all the therapies I would consider giving a patient, and discuss all of them on a blank sheet of paper, starting with the, the agents, starting with schedule, really practical things, and then major toxicities. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's enough data right now to clearly say this is definitely what we should do number two, this is definitely what we mm -hmm. should do number three, and rather, I'd, I'd like patients to have a, an understanding of oh, there's a wedding coming up and I would like something a little bit less, less toxic for these next couple yeah. months. And, and it really is a choice of order rather than a, 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 a strong prescription that this is, has to be your next therapy. And so I think the discussion based on the known toxicities really helps patients guide and really helps patients anticipate and really helps patients choose what makes the most sense for them. Yeah, and, and this is interesting. Going back to one of George's comments, how we break the rules, but it almost sounds like patients can be involved in, in helping you decide what therapies in what order, right? I mean, Absolutely. what do you guys think about it? How do you approach it? Could we also plug clinical trials? And I think, yeah. of course. Um, I mean, this is our jobs and we're academic physicians and we're academic oncologists. And as we will move into talking about all these new drugs that have come to market, none of these drugs would be on the market if it wasn't patients' willingness to go into these clinical trials, whether or not they were with placebo, and there's always a fear of placebo, whether or not they were, af whether they were not used with Another agent that may or may not have some degree of activity, but an older agent. I think everybody, everybody listens and everybody watches TV and there's these great commercials now of all these great drugs that are for not their disease. And it has to be at one point for their disease. And I think that as we do talk about all this and we offer them clinical trials, that is a very important um, message for them, I think, for first line, for second line, for third line, fourth line. Um, but certainly, I mean, exactly as you said, there, there is no ability to prescribe a medication without a conversation that really involves a frank discussion and really trying to figure out what do they want, what are their goals. That's great. And, and I love this journey, this, this race, this marathon that we keep talking about. Any, any other thoughts? I take a very similar approach um, at the second and, and third line conversation. And as I'm talking, I also write on a piece of paper the name of the drug, um, two or three words about schedule. Um, for the women I take care of, it really matters whether they will or will not lose their hair. Again, perhaps if it's come back after being off first-line therapy for some time. Um, I do try to explain the, different, you know, the concept of a resist response, and particularly for second-line drugs, like um, second or third line drugs like pizopanib or trevectidin, where objective response rates may be relatively low, but disease control rates might be relatively good. I want them to understand that if they go to Google and look for a response rate and they find it scare too low yeah. to feel palatable to them, right. I want them to understand the concept of a progression-free survival, a concept of how long you can be on a tolerable drug for some time, feeling well, before you need to switch to the next thing. And the nice thing about writing things down is that they can keep that piece of paper and say they chose B on that piece of paper. They know that those other choices are still out there. It's very comforting for them to know that after second, that there's going to be a next to talk about. But this is the other rule we break, right? In pancreas cancer, virtually nobody makes it to fourth or fifth line therapy. I would say the majority of patients yeah. at our centers make it to fifth, sixth, seventh line therapy, which is unusual. So I think we all wind up doing the same thing. We make the big list. And I say to people, here, we have options. Um, and the issue for us is to decide together which of these options, I think we have options now in terms of schedule, oral, IV, things that fit their lifestyle, things that have certain benefits. And then as professionals, typically the patients will say, you've seen a lot more of these than I have. I'm not making this decision alone. I say, no, but let, let's make it together, the shared decision making that Paolo Casale in Italy always talks about. Yeah, no, it's true. And I, I'm finding, too, more and more patients are coming with their own list, right, because oh, sure. with that information, and that helps guide discussions as well. But so, my wor so I'll just say one thing, but my worry always is the, the patient who doesn't know better or can't bring that list 
and as somewhere that doesn't have the list, I always worry about the two lines and hospice. Yeah. That is always worry for me because all of us, you, you said we don't have patients that don't get four, five, six lines of therapy. We just don't see those patients, but there are patients out there in the community that really stop after two, um, and that does really, that it, it, that's disheartening that there isn't that better education out there. Yeah, I think so. I, I think it is a difference where, you know, there is this journey that we can continue to work with patients on, right? And I think that's an important thing to understand. But before we move on into some of these options, I just want to get an idea of how often you monitor patients. I mean, do you start a regimen and you walk away and five months later you come back? Or oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do? What do you do? I... For the chemotherapeutics, I'm often doing every two cycles. Every two cycles. Um, yeah. As I get to third and fourth line, depending on what the drug and the toxicity profile is, I may I usually then start to extend it to three cycles, so nine weeks typically. For the targeted agents, I typically do several months, um, sometimes three months. Um, try not to scan too early. Try to temper some of the expectations and really try to allow someone to get a full try on these drugs. So I think this is one area where what we write in clinical trials yeah. is indeed how we practice. Yeah, Early on in point. the course of the therapy, we want to take a closer look to make sure that the efficacy toxicity balance is still maintained in the patient's favor. And as they get on cruise control mode, if you will, you can space out the scans. A comment I wanted to make about the previous conversation is that, again, this is probably more relevant to our colleagues in the community that the general principles we outlined for second line and future line therapies is absolutely correct and no disagreement, but there are nuances about individual histologies mm -hmm. that only we would know, and we are guilty of not publishing and writing everything up, and even if it's there, it's in some obscure thing that they can't have access to, mm -hmm. right? So it gets to the examples of if it's an angiosarcoma, don't send them to the surgeon to cut it out. There are lots of different drugs, and we can try taxanes, for example. If you go to synovial sarcoma, for example, well, the gemcitabine docetaxel experience doesn't seem to be that great. Maybe right. Votriant or Pazopanib would be a good idea. Right. So I think those are the kinds of things where the word out there would be, pick up the phone and call your I local agree. consultant, if you will, right? I, I, and we can frequently guide you in terms of what may be a better strategy or a better sequence, recognizing that sometimes right. you end up going through the whole sequence for one reason or another. And, and, and I'll only say not only a phone call, but have the patient visit, right? Because I think any one of us can look at a patient for five seconds and say, I know exactly what they're able to tolerate or where we can begin to gauge them. And sometimes doing that over the phone can be very difficult, yes. right? Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, too, because we'll have to talk about how to manage toxicities. But I think.